so uh, what is happening around uh, sustainable finance in the COVID era? First, um, a very, very serious push uh, for a green recovery, uh, but also a, a much greater awareness because of COVID uh, of the need to address uh, existential risks, which uh, previously might have been seen to be uh, remote, uh, but no longer so. Now, uh, I think uh, those who have heard me speak in the past have uh, realized that uh, I think that uh, climate change uh, is the most urgent of these uh, existential risks. Uh, and this, uh, together with some other aspects of environmental finance, is what I will uh, focus on today. Uh, although, of course, uh, social issues in sustainable finance are, are now much higher, in the are higher on the agenda, again, because of, um, because of COVID. Now, from a, a regulator's perspective, and after all, uh, that's the perspective I'm speaking from because uh, I am a regulator, uh, the basic disclosure framework uh, underpinning uh, environmental and especially climate finance is now actually pretty well established. And there are four main elements. First, and very, very importantly, corporate disclosures uh, and I would call what, at what I would call um, the real economy uh, or corporate level. Uh, and that in particular is about uh, uh, financial risk disclosure. In other words, uh, uh, risks uh, that may affect uh, the financial position and prospects of a company or business. Uh, and uh, that really is divided into now the very familiar uh, areas of physical uh, risks and transition risks. Uh, but also, of course, we have uh, the added component of impact disclosures uh, through scopes one to three when it comes to uh, carbon footprints. Second, uh, disclosures and labeling uh, are for financial products. And that's things like green bonds, green funds, etc. Uh, and this in particular hinges uh, on properly constructed green finance taxonomies, which as many of you will know, are under development. And third, uh, asset manager disclosures and integration of sustainable finance at the manager, uh, but also at the individual fund level. And uh, the SFC's own consultation on some pretty significant amendments to our own fund manager code of conduct uh, issued last week is, uh, we think, a major step in this direction for Hong Kong. Uh, and fourth and finally, uh, incorporating climate related risks into prudential stress testing of balance sheets of banks and insurers. Uh, and I should say there that, that transition risks as well as physical risks uh, are embedded uh, in balance sheet assets and liabilities across the banking and insurance world. And then I just, those are the sort of four main components of the, uh, of, I think of the regulatory uh, framework and the disclosure framework. And, but I should also say that more recently uh, there are far greater expectations of businesses to disclose how they will in practice uh, hit the net zero targets they are increasingly uh, setting themselves. Now, uh, before I get on to sort of some wider topics, what is the SFC's latest consultation uh, address to fund managers all about? Well, firstly, it uh, again recognizes the special risks uh, associated with climate change. Uh, so concentrates solely on climate finance. Uh, it goes back to one of the priorities of a strategic uh, framework we set out in 2018 around green finance, which was to engage with the asset management industry to formulate an appropriate regulatory approach to climate change risks. Uh, now, last year, uh, we did a survey of uh, asset managers and asset owners in Hong Kong, and this indicated possibly unsurprisingly uh, that there isn't a consistent approach to integrating uh, climate related information and risks into the investment, investment process. Uh, and of course, that really does not meet the expectations of asset owners. Uh, and basically, that means the sort of local approaches and practices on, aren't in line uh, with international developments. So in a nutshell, uh, the proposals that uh, we unveiled last week therefore aim to uh, foster far greater awareness among asset owners 
of climate related risks and opportunities throughout the investment process. Uh, and they should also strengthen uh, governance frameworks and encourage more systematic risk management uh, of the implications of climate change by a whole range of asset managers. Uh, I won't go into the details now. Uh, they're set out, I think, pretty clearly in the consultation itself. And we do obviously encourage the industry uh, to respond uh, to those proposals. Uh, and I should also mention that in that context that, of course, as a regulator, tackling greenwashing, which is seen to be uh, an increasingly difficult topic to tackle, um, tackling greenwashing is, is, an increasing, is, is a key priority for us. And of course, is a major part of the uh, agenda for uh, global regulators. Now, uh, having said all of that, I should say that uh, the uh, availability of comparable data and metrics, emphasizing the word comparable, at a corporate, or in other words, at a real economy level, is an absolutely crucial component of an overall climate finance framework. This is absolutely essential to enable asset managers to have the information necessary to actually integrate climate change and environmental risk uh, into their disclosures and processes. Uh, it's essential to enable central banks to stress test corporate loan books, and it's essential for investors to understand carbon footprints and the potential impact of climate change on businesses. Uh, and of course, consistency and comparability of that corporate or real economy disclosure is essential on a global basis, given that uh, climate change is a global risk. Uh, now, of course, we aren't there yet. And the reality is that uh, multiple and diverse sustainability frameworks and standards lead to confusion and they prevent information from being uh, in a well-worn phrase, uh, being uh, decision useful. Now, uh, very recently, uh, the fine five main uh, standard setters in this area, including the likes of GRI and SASB, have stated their determination to harmonize uh, climate standards and to incorporate this outcome into a single global framework. Uh, and this effort, which is extremely welcome, uh, may also be enabled by a consultation issued uh, this month by the IFRS Foundation, which has proposed to set up a new sustainability standard setting board uh, alongside the existing uh, International uh, Accounting Standards Board, which issues uh, the quite well known IFRS uh, Global Accounting Standards. Now, there are lots of acronyms there, but basically, IASB is the body uh, that uh, uh, originates uh, standards for accounting that apply across the world and sit alongside uh, US GAAP. So the, you know, they are hugely significant. And in fact, the IFRS, um, uh, the IFRS standards originated with proposals uh, from IOSCO, which I currently chair. And IOSCO, of course, uh, is pleased to see this initiative happen. So uh, the significance of this really is that for the first time we could have in the offing uh, a single standard setter uh, promising uh, three uh, sort of major um, attributes, uh, which is essential to move to the next uh, level of um, real economy disclosure or corporate disclosure. One, of course, is convergence, which I've mentioned, convergence of standards. The second is robust governance around the issue of standards. And the third, um, not free from difficulty, but it's certainly there is a pathway here. The third is around independent assurance around the quality uh, of disclosure. And that assurance uh, uh, could be similar uh, to the type of assurance that uh, the audit process gives in relation to normal accounting disclosures and financial statements. Now, uh, switching gears, I just should mention very briefly technology, uh, including blockchain. This can also help these efforts by enabling uh, vital but complex uh, data verification in this area. Uh, this could lead to potential solutions for carbon accounting, which, for example, uh, can help mitigate challenges around reliable scope three uh, emissions estimates, which are notoriously 
uh, difficult but important. And on top of this, you know, we've seen uh, some significant uh, recent national commitments, including China's uh, carbon neutral target, as well as Japan and Korea's in this part of the world. Uh, and of course, other develop developments are uh, adding to this by accelerating the pace of change. Harmonized taxonomies, and I mentioned that earlier in the context of financial products, um, should further help direct financing to businesses supporting the transition. Uh, and there I point to the current effort to produce an, a far more aligned EU-China taxonomy, um, which is welcome. And I think I probably should say that that effort was uh, kicked off, uh, I think, by, an F, uh, by a meeting in Hong Kong that took place quite some months ago, where we were convinced that uh, China and Europe working together, being leaders in this field, would be important uh, to ensure that comparability can uh, take place across uh, economies accounting for roughly 40% of global GDP. Um, we've seen new legislation around sustainable finance, again in the EU and of course in China, and I just point to the Shenzhen uh, green finance legislation, which is uh, quite recent. Uh, and on top of this, we, we, we continue to see moves from what I would call greening finance to financing green. Now the latter is mainly a political process, it's not regulatory, and it, it's around topics such as carbon pricing, carbon taxes, carbon subsidies, et cetera. But of course, those political decisions would then be picked up in green financing when measuring increased transition risks for businesses. In other words, uh, in one respect, more stranded assets potentially. So to wrap up, um, the policy framework for green finance is set. Uh, and central banks and market regulators like the SFC are fully engaged. Uh, the challenges, especially around the consistency and reliability of disclosures are clear and acknowledged, but the recent moves I've mentioned to converge the main global standards and merge them into an IFRS-like framework is hugely encouraging and could be a game changer. Uh, the success of that framework would actually mean that the asset management disclosures uh, under the SFC's new proposals would be even more meaningful. And finally, I would say that it is critical that Hong Kong, albeit uh, small in size physically, um, it nevertheless naturally plays a leading role as one of the world's premier international financial centers, uh, intermediating global capital into the vast China market, which itself accounts for a very large proportion uh, of global carbon emissions. So I'll leave it there and uh, all the best for uh, the rest of the, of the uh, conference.